Okay, this is uh, the review for the third midterm. It's in week 13. Uh, it's usually in week 13 uh, before Thanksgiving. The other one, week, uh, midterm number two, is a bit late, primarily because we could only get access to the testing center then. So my apologies for that. Uh, same as before, uh, all tests are closed book, closed notes. Uh, you can take a calculator and pencil. Uh, scratch paper will be provided for the ones that are at the uh, testing center. There's an equation sheet that's included on the, uh, the end of the exam in Canvas, uh, and that's what we'll talk about here. I'll be just uh, screen captured from below. And for this set, Monday and Fridays are in the testing center, but the Wednesday test is on your own recognizance, wherever you choose to do it. The classroom's open, but you might want to choose to do it in your uh, apartment. Um, yeah, and you've done some of these before, so you don't probably need to see the practice exam. The material that's covered is from week uh, eight onwards. So you remember that begins with our discussion of the one-dimensional conservation of energy equations, uh, dimensional analysis, and then two weeks talking about uh, pipe flow um, for progressively more complex uh, uh, behavior of pipes. But it doesn't cover pipe networks, which I guess was uh, in the third class of uh, week 11. The three questions are as below. Um, first one on Monday is energy equation uh, related to pipe flow. Uh, the second one is on dimensional analysis. There's always a dimensional analysis question in this uh, third test. And they're kind of recipe-like, so you should be able to follow those. So you can certainly look at previous ones and see what they are. They all follow the same format. And the third one was energy equation uh, and pipe flow. And actually, you need to kind of revisit manometer equations for that. I mentioned those right at the bottom of this. So in terms of material, in week eight, we talked about the energy equation. We explained it in terms of this geometry, that if you look from upstream to downstream, you can always write uh, Bernoulli's equation, which is the energy equation for this. It's the energy equation because we've added uh, potential inputs and losses to the system in pump heads and losses to the system in terms of hydraulic uh, losses. Uh, you can think of it in terms of flowing from one tank to another, upstream and downstream. This always has to be upstream with the pump head on this side of the equation because uh, it, it matters that you flow downstream. You can think of these some terms as being an elevation head, a pressure head, a velocity head, and a pump, which are these three terms added together. And you think about the same on the downstream side as being an elevation head, pressure head, a velocity head, and a head loss. And the, the pump magnitude could be um, positive if you're putting energy into the system, or if you're taking energy out of the system, it'll be a, a negative as a turbine. Um, what else? Uh, you have to be able to figure out how to get your equation as easy as possible. If it's a big tank upstream and a big tank downstream, then that's useful because the velocities on those big tanks go to zero. But of course, the velocity on the pipe in between, which is what figures into the loss equations, is not uh, zero. So this has to be the average velocity or a velocity that you're pointed to in the question. The head losses uh, or the head inputs in a pump are positive uh, if it's a pump, it's negative if it's a turbine. It's always a, a length, uh, and you can convert that length into the power that comes out of the pump as a function of the length, the mass flow rate, kilograms per second, and gravity, or the mass flow rate is just the product of the density and the volumetric flow rate. And if you know the velocity that's uh, flowing in the pipe, you can always get the, the mass flow rate if you know what the cross-sectional area of that pipe is. The head losses fall into two categories. I'm never sure whether these are minor or major losses or switch between them. But one is for bends and elbows, which we really haven't talked about uh, up till equa um, uh, Yeah, we did talk about this. We talked about bends and elbows in as a function of a loss coefficient and the um, uh, velocity head term. And for major losses, which are pipe losses along the length of a pipe, which are also in units of length, uh, and as a function of the velocity head, 
how long the pipe is relative to its diameter, and also a friction factor. Uh, I think the only one you need this time around is to, to be able to use this uh, single loss equation. Uh, we talked about pipe flow. Uh, there's not much. Uh, well, uh, we, there's not much in terms of using this uh, major loss term. I think in the the test. But if you are looking at uh, pipe flow, then we define the pipes in terms of a diameter, its length, it has a roughness, it has a velocity. We can always, if we know the volumetric flow rate, calculate the velocity from the volumetric flow rate divided by an area. Um, because we need that in the head loss equation. And these other terms mean that just the head loss scales with the length of the pipe. If the pipe is twice as long, then the head loss will be twice as long for the given flow velocity and appropriate friction factor, which is representative of the uh, essentially the Reynolds number in the system. Um, we know that power is the product of force times uh, velocity. Uh, as well, if we need to get it. Um, I, can't, I don't think you necessarily need to use that, um, but you have that there. Uh, and if you want to calculate the magnitudes of the friction factor, typically uh, you calculate those from a Moody chart. If you want to calculate the magnitudes of the loss coefficient, it's a single value that's representative of the feature, such as a, a bend in a pipe or, or a filter within a pipe. And uh, the magnitude of that stays constant, independent of the changes in velocity. If you want to get the loss coefficients uh, for the friction factor, you can get it from a Moody chart. I don't think you need to do it on this exam, so that cuts you a bit of a break. Um, but it just defines a friction factor as a function of the flow regime that you find yourself in, defined in terms of a Reynolds number, velocity density, characteristic dimension, which is the pipe diameter, and the viscosity of the fluid that's flowing. For laminar flow, less than a Reynolds number of 2,000, the friction factor is a function of Reynolds number. Typically for a pipe, it's uh, 64 over RE for a circular pipe, uh, and, not, and independent of roughness of that pipe. And for turbulent flow, for Reynolds numbers higher than 2,000, then the friction factor is independent of Reynolds number, but it's a function of the relative roughness of the pipe. Epsilon is the amplitude of the roughness, D is the diameter of the pipe, um, and the magnitudes of that roughness are for progressively rougher pipes going up in this direction. But as I say, I don't think you need that. Uh, we've talked about uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3 um, problems in solving pipe flow problems. Uh, probably you'll be happy to know that you don't need to know those distinctions for this test. There's always a Buckingham Pi question for dimensional analysis. Uh, you'll remember that it's a way of being able to define a minimum set of variables that can allow you to solve, uh, to run a, num a minimum number of experiments to be able to define the behavior of a system. That's really what it is. And so we define a couple of parameters. One is how many of mass, length, and time, so kilograms, meters per second, how many of those are represented in the variables. And that's the number of K. K can be a maximum of three. I guess if you had temperature as one of those, which we I'm not sure we talked about, it could be four. Uh, N is the number of variables that describe your problem. It might be the diameter of the tube. It might be the density of the fluid that's flowing and its velocity, the length of the pipe, and the viscosity. So in this particular case, the number of variables would be five. And so the number of pi groups that describe your problem would be the number of variables minus the number of groups that are uh, mass, length, and time that are represented. So if kilograms, meters, and seconds are represented, then that would be three. Here in this particular case, this would be five. So the number of pi groups would be five minus three, which is two. That means that you can go and use the recipe for developing the pi groups. You're always told what that recipe is, primarily because if you use a different set of group of uh, parameters, you'll end up with uh, a different group. Uh, so you need to be uh, told exactly what those are. So in this particular case, if the repeating variables are diameter, density, and velocity, 
and the single variable in each turn, the two remaining variables are either length or viscosity, then the solution to using those is to develop uh, the relationship where this is to the power 1 and you use Buckingham Pi to be able to determine exactly what the magnitudes of the exponents are for A, B, and C so that when you look at these four variables the overall exponents of mass, length, and time in these progressively is uh, zero. So they, so they are dimensionless. So you do that for the first pi group by using the parameter that you're told to use. You do it for the second pi group. Um, there's only two pi groups because we have two extra parameters. Five minus three is the two extra parameters which are length and viscosity in this particular case. Again, you find out what the new values of A, B, and C are, and that allows you to define exactly what your second pi group is. It's not unusual that these pi groups, not always the case, it's not, always, it's not unusual that these pi groups would be equivalent to important non-dimensional parameters that describe the system. Typically, one of them would be the Reynolds number. Typically, one of them would be the Euler number. And if there was an extra one, typically it might be a ratio of geometries or lengths, that defining the ge geometric similitude. So anyway, so that's the recipe that you need to apply to be able to get the pi groups. Then once you have those, uh, what you can do is then you can use those to think about exactly what your system is. If you only have two pi groups, say, for instance, Reynolds number and Euler number, then if you, that means that you'd have a single expression that allows you to link those. So if you know the value of the Reynolds number um, this, defining this behavior, you can immediately define what the Euler number would be for that system. So that's the second step. The first step before that is that in a system, typically you want to represent similitude between uh, the geometry of the system, kinematic similitude, which means that it's flowing in the same regime in both model and prototype, and dynamic similitude means the forces applied on the structure are equivalent in the uh, model and the prototype. So the first one is, is the model must be have geometric similitude so that the ratio of the lengths of the model and the prototype must be a constant. This would apply for the length of the pipe and the ratio of the diameters of the pipe. So this would be the requirement uh, of these. Kinematic similitude would be that the Reynolds number of the model that you're running at would be exactly the same as the Reynolds number in the prototype. So that means that the flow pattern, say in this case around a, a sphere, would be the same in the model and the prototype. So the, in this case, this is a turbulent flow around a, uh, a sphere. has to be bigger than a Reynolds number of 2,000, say 4,000, where you're getting separation. So you'd want the flow around your model and the prototype to look exactly the same if you took a snapshot. That's what kin kinematic similitude represents. And finally, dynamic similitude means that the forces applied on your structure in the model are related to each other because the Euler number of those two things are the same. And so if you know what the variables are that make up Euler's number, well, you know that Euler's number is... Um, the pressure, which represents the force applied on the structure, density times velocity squared. We, you know that the Reynolds number is equal to a characteristic dimension of velocity and a density divided by viscosity. You're just looking at the equivalence between those numbers in the model and the prototype. So the graphical description of what that is, is that if you just have two pi groups, say one is the Euler number and one is the Reynolds number, then you'd have a relationship that would represent those. So if you know what the Reynolds number is in your model, you could calculate the force that was applied in your model. And so if the Reynolds number in your model and the um, prototype are the same, then that means that the Euler number in the model and the prototype would be the same. 
And that means if you know what, say, the velocity is that you're applying here, for the Euler number, the only thing you, you wouldn't know typically, well, this would be the equation. If you know the Reynolds number in the model and the prototype, then by definition you know the velocity. If you know that the Euler number in the model and the prototype are the same, that gives you a way of pulling out the pressures or the forces that were applied on it. So that's the, the method of using that. And finally, I guess I said the other one, I guess the third question has the need to be able to use the, the manometer rules that we dealt with early in the class. Must seem very easy for you now. And uh, the ones that you need to realize that if you go up or down in the system, if you go down, you add pressures, the pressure increases, as we know, just like going in a swimming pool. If you move up, as you go from one location to another, then you subtract the pressures in the system. You don't need to know that the vapor, if you have a vapor in the system, then you use the vapor pressure. Or if you go up or down in the gas, then the gas density or unit weight is very small compared to the liquid, and so you can assume that it is zero. So, so that's a quick uh, run through what we've talked about. Obviously, this isn't meant to be a substitute for going back to thinking about what is in your notes and what is in the other videos. And as I said in class the other day, if I was doing uh, getting ready for this test, I would look at where at the previous review um, videos in the last number of years and see where these terms actually come up and see what the questions are that these terms relate to because you have that linkage in this. So that's it. So uh, don't forget that two of the tests, uh, Monday and Friday, are in Pollock and the middle one is in uh, wherever you want to take it. Okay? Best of luck. Thanks very much. And one final point that might be worth making is that when you're doing a dimensional analysis, uh, looking at similitude, typically these are the two parameters that uh, come up as part of the pi group, so you can get those by inspection, but you might want to know what the uh, units of these individual components are. Uh, viscosity is Pascal seconds, uh, you can take the Newtons, and of course you can write the Newtons as kilograms meter per second squared, which is a definition of a Newton, it's the force required to give a kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second squared, and so the units ultimately come out to be mass uh, over length times time, mass length minus one, t minus one. And likewise for pressure, uh, pascals, newtons per meter squared, same calculation, and it gives you these magnitudes. The other ones that you might uh, need, well, you know exactly what these are. Density is mass per unit uh, volume, or mass over length to the power of three. And velocity is length times time. So certainly you have those under control. Okay? Very good. Good luck.